my, my wife's laughing at me over there. <laughs> All right, let me make sure it's cooking. Yep, it is. All right. Well, good. This is actually probably the quickest we started the video yet. <laughs> I was only about a minute in. Um, okay. So do you want me to just keep uh, trucking from where we were uh, last week? And, okay. Okay. So let me, oh, I got to share this. Are you traveling anywhere for Thanksgiving or doing it at your house or just chilling? What's the what? my house? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I invited myself to one of our friends from church's houses. <laughs> All I had to provide was a six dollar pumpkin pie. Yep. Yeah. So I got a pretty good deal out of it. <laughs> All right, so uh, so last time we kind of talked about, uh, we, we started, well, I, we built this slide um, along the way. And actually, let me add to this slide a little bit just so we kind of have that foundation laid out in front of us. Uh, what I usually do is I label the stuff out here as native languages. Yep. And then what I do is I create a, another section over here and I'll explain a couple things in here because this is kind of cool stuff too all right um, so and let me throw this out I'll just throw it in here like this list a bunch of things first and we'll kind of go through it uh, so we have Perl let's go PHP and you can see my screen right yep okay uh, then let's throw Ruby in here we'll kind of toss Python right around there mm-hmm and then I'll throw, and there's some being skipped in here, but I'll throw Node.js in there. Okay. Um, now, have you, you've heard of JavaScript before, right? Yep. Okay. Have you heard of Perl? Uh, I've heard of it. Okay. Yeah, that one's a little bit old, so that would have been something that you maybe either would have heard of in passing or something like that. But you've probably heard of PHP. Yep. Uh, probably heard of Ruby, but maybe only in the context of somebody seeing Ruby on Rails. Yeah. Okay. Um, and obviously you've heard of Python. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you heard of Node.js before? Never, no. Okay. That's kind of a, one of our newer kids, let's say. I'll actually throw a, another one here just for completeness. Um, actually, I'm going to throw it out here. I'm going to say... Um, What is the first one? Well, I'm gonna throw this out there. We have something called jQuery. Have you heard of that? Never. Okay. And then we're going to have Angular. Have you heard of that? Nope. React. I think I've heard of that one. Okay. And what is the first one here? It starts with a... Ajax. Have you heard of Ajax before? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going to throw it out here for right now, and we'll kind of swing back to it. We actually might talk about it here in a second. I'm just thinking about how I want to connect the dots. Um, what I usually do here is I kind of talk about these guys as web languages. Yep. All right. Now, uh, way back when we first started, and I'm going to, we're going to get to iOS versus Android at some point, but I'm going to jump in here in the middle of between these two sections. Um, we're going to talk about HTML for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, what is HTML? Don't know. Okay. You've heard of it though, right? Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about it? Can you tell me 
maybe what it's used for? Can you do you have any information about it other than just you've heard of it? I've literally just heard it. Okay, yeah, fair enough. That's fine. So HTML stands for Hypertext Transport Language. Okay. All right, so that's what the guy stands for. So obviously that's self-explanatory, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, tra yeah, hypertext markup language. Thank you. My wife just corrected me. Um, the uh, punchline where I got the transport from is we have this something called HTTP, which is hypertext transport protocol. All right, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second, but. At the end of the day, what is HTML used for? It is used to represent web pages. Yep. All right. So that takes us kind of to our a slide here. How does the web work? And this is kind of important for us because Python is kind of belongs, if you notice in my little chart here, Python's over here on my web language side of things, right? Even yep. though Python's used for all sorts of stuff other than just the web. All right, yep. so when we say how does the web or internet, however you want to think about it, but technically the internet is a collection of technologies. One of those technologies is www, which is World Wide Web. And HTML is used for that guy. So, on the internet, we have this thing called the web server. All right. We yep. also have a web client. All right. So, and then in between those two is the internet. All right, so our web client connects to the web server somehow. All right, so in the middle here, we're going to just call this guy the internet. All right, now realistically, you've probably never um, referred to a piece of software as a web client, even though you've used web clients all the time. In fact, you're using a web client right now. So typically, we think of web clients, we think of them as our web browsers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what a web client is. So, what's the job of a web browser? Okay, so a web browser, this is like Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Safari, pick your poison, right? Okay, yep. so that's what our web browsers are. Um, what do these guys do? Well, for one hand, uh, on one hand, they know how to interpret... HTML into pretty pictures and text. All right. So when you go to a web page, so have you ever done view source on a web page before? Uh, I think so. All right. So here I'm going to stop this screen share and then I'm going to share it again and I'll just share my entire screen for a moment and I'll switch over here. Google's a good page for this. All right, so I went to Google's homepage here, right? Yep. Okay, and this looks like a pretty simple page, doesn't it? Yep. Now, if I right-click on this guy. Oh, yeah, and then you go to Inspect. Um, you can say View Page Source. Uh, yep. You might have to do it through Inspect, but I'm going to say View Page Source on here. It's probably in your browser, too. It's going to bring up this wall of text. So in here we have HTML and there's actually some JavaScript and stuff like that, um, and, you know, in here as well that I'll I'll mention here in a few minutes. But you know, all of this is what ultimately gets interpreted by your web browser to look like this. Yeah. Okay. So a lot going on there. Now Google is at the it's a good and a bad example at the same time. So Google is a good example from the perspective of they have a very a simple looking page, but when we do view page source, we see it on the other extreme where there's a whole bunch of stuff. All right. Yeah. Where if you went to a page that maybe looked like it had more going on, maybe like MSN's homepage or something like that, and you yeah. said view page source, you'd see about the same amount of stuff. Um, but maybe more of it would be HTML, less of it would be JavaScript. Google has a lot of JavaScript on their page, and we'll talk about where that connects in a, in a few minutes. All yeah. right, 
So let me flip back now. All right, so a web browser knows how to interpret HTML. Yep. But it also knows how to run JavaScript code. Yep. All right, and why this is important is it gets down to when we talked about originally, if you go all the way back to the beginning of our slides here, we talked about what is programming, telling a computer what to do, how do human beings solve, pro uh, solve problems, memory asking questions and repetition, what's a programming language, gives programs a, uh, um, a way to tell a computer what to do, preferably similar to how we already solve problems. But I mentioned here that 100% of programming languages have facilities for the, th for the ways human beings solve problems. And I introduced this slide here called the mapping. So human beings solve problems using our memory, asking questions and repetition. 100% of programming languages um, will have facilities for these three things. So for example, memory might be done through variables, asking questions might be done through conditionals like if statements, and repetition might be done through loops and functions. Okay? Um, so that's kind of telling us the definition of a programming language. So now we go all the way back down here where we're talking about HTML. I'm going to leave that protocol thing there for a second. Is HTML a programming language? Okay, now, you don't have the context to answer this yet, but the answer is no. HTML is not a programming language. Why? It doesn't allow you to define variables. It doesn't allow you to ask questions. It doesn't allow you to uh, write loops or subroutines. Okay, so I've mentioned that 100% of programming languages have facilities for all three of those things. HTML doesn't have facilities for any of them. All right. Now, does that mean that HTML is, is bad? Well, no, we, we still use it today. I'm going to connect a few more dots here in a few minutes. But HTML is actually something called a data representation language. Yes. Okay, so you've heard of HTML. Have you heard or seen XML before? You've heard of no. it? What about JSON? Have you heard of that? No. Okay. Um, but let's just leave those up on the screen for now. We may or may not get to them today. But um, rest assured that uh, XML was uh, strongly inspired by HTML. There's a little bit of a circular relationship there. But HTML is good enough for us for the moment. Okay. Yep. Okay, but these are all data representation languages. And what, what does it mean for something to be a data representation language? This is a language used to describe the meaning of some data rather than logic. Let's just leave it at, let's just leave it at that, rather than logic, just in general. So when we think about programming, we're typically thinking about performing logic. When we're thinking about, uh, now we might say, well, what are you often performing logic on? Well, we might be performing it on some data. And that's where variables come in. Where maybe we're performing it on string data or integer data or character data, something like that. Well, sometimes we have more complex data that we might need to represent in some way. And one of our early data representation standards, we might say, was called HTML. Um, if you want to put some predecessors to this guy, um, have you heard of CSV files before? I have. Okay, this is comma separated values. You know, so a lot of spreadsheets like Excel and stuff will, can save uh, files in this format. Okay, where it basically takes all of your cells into just uh, you know, the cells you have in the spreadsheet and it will store them with commas in between them. So your data is kind of represented in some way, a very simplified way with commas between them, but it's still in a way that if you saw a document that had a whole bunch of individual pieces of data with a little comma in between them, as a human being, you could look at that and say, ah, I see how the data is organized here, 
and then you could perceivably write a uh, or conceivably write a program that could split that up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so these all have to do with our, um, you know, data representation language idea. But right now we're talking about HTML and we're trying to understand how the internet actually works. Okay, so our web browser knows how to um, read uh, and interpret HTML. Yep. All right. Now, when you go to web pages, now, have you ever um, had to log into a web page? Yep. Okay, and you've been to web pages that, that actually do some stuff that has, like, logic on it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some web pages have, like, little games and things like that embedded in them, right? Yep. Okay, so it seems like uh, web pages do more than just show information. They must have some other tool for doing some of these extra things. So now we've said HTML is only there for data representation. So that means that since it's, it lacks the programming language uh, facilities of memory, asking questions, and repetition, there must be another helper there that allows it to do the programming stuff. All right. mm -hmm. And back on this chart, that helper is called JavaScript. Okay. So we go back here to our web browser. This guy knows how to interpret HTML, knows how to run JavaScript code. So up here, we'll say pretty, well, we already said that. I'm just going to do it this way. So interpret HTML can, gives us pretty pictures and text. Knows how to run JavaScript. Gives us programming logic. So now our web browser can do both of those things. All right. In fact, kind of an interesting tool once you get to the point where programming is something that, you know, you feel you're pretty skilled at and it might almost be easier than going in, uh, you know, getting at opening up a calculator or opening up a spreadsheet or something. You can actually write a quick JavaScript program in like Notepad or something and just run it right inside of a web browser. You don't need to have a compiler or interpreter or anything like that installed in your computer. So like for this class, you had to install Python, right? Yeah. And all that stuff. Well, any computer that has a web browser on it already has an interpreter for running JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. So that's what a web browser here is now what's a web server so we'll create another slide here so a web server receives request for um, web documents, I'm just going to say, typically we think about these as HTML pages, but I'm going to say, but potentially more, and we'll fill in the gaps there in a few minutes. They look up the file associated with the request. They process the file if necessary yep. and they send the file or serve back to the requesting web browser. Okay. So that's what a web server does. So this guy uh, is going, you know, he receives requests from this guy. So now mm -hmm. these two programs, they live on different parts of the, in the part, different parts of the internet, right? So right now you're on a web browser and somewhere out there, when you use your web browser to do stuff, you're making a request to a web server. Yep. Okay. Now, right now you and I are speaking. Yep. Right. And why is it that we're speaking English? Um, because that's what we were taught. But how did you know? I mean, was there some sort of email exchange we went through beforehand where 
we agreed upon speaking English on the uh, our chats? Or was that just an uh, assumption we made because we're kind of both from the United States and there was at least a pretty good shot of, uh, of that? Yeah, probably the second one. Okay. So... Have you seen the word protocols before? Yes. Okay, do you know what that you know what protocols mean? Uh it's like every time something happens do this type thing. Okay. Fancy way of saying language. Oh. Okay, so right now you and I are using the English protocol. All yep. right. And the English protocol is actually a pretty complex protocol. Uh, so, you know, between the two of us, we have to kind of, you know, once we start talking, we have to finagle our speech patterns to get us into, you know, use vocabularies that are, that likely both of us are familiar with and, and things like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the English protocol is really, really, really complex, but in general, when we say a protocol, you know, right off the bat, you kind of assume, oh, this is kind of a techie or a geeky type of conversation, right? We think of yeah. protocols as technology things. All right, yep. where if somebody walked up to you and you know said, "Hey, is using the English protocol here okay?" You would look at them like a weirdo and walk off, right? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Although technically, I probably wouldn't. I would probably talk to them. <laughs> but but in general, that, that's going to come off as being sort of weird. All right. Yep. So so that's what protocols are in general. So now in here. The language that web browsers use to speak to web servers is a language called HTTP, which is Hypertext Transport Protocol. Oh. Okay. So rather than them talk English to each other, you know, English well, is like... Is that we, an HTTPS dot dot slash slash? Yeah, HTTPS is a secure version of Hypertext Transport Protocol. It's an encrypted version using um, another technology called SSL, Secure Socket Layer. Uh, that makes a lot of sense now. Okay. But these are just languages. But the reality is, is when a web browser talks to a web server, they're, they're doing something significantly simpler uh, or significantly more simple. Let's just go with most simplest because that's <laughs> definitely wrong, so I don't have to worry about the grammar. All right. So... Yep. Um, they're doing something much, much simpler than you and I talking to each other and having to have all these little caveats and things like that, right? When, in, when humans speak to each other, there's all sorts of extra stuff going on. You know, facial expressions and hand waving and stuff like that, right? Well, yep. when a web browser speaks to a web server, they really only need to do two or three things very, very well. Okay, so this HTTP language, even though all this stuff sounds all you know, uh, techie and difficult and all this stuff is actually a pretty simple language. It only actually knows how to do four things. <laughs> There's four, four words in the language, if you, if you will. All right, so hypertext transport protocol is a really fancy way of saying the, the language that web browsers speak to web servers. Yep. Okay. Um, now, I mentioned that when we talked about web servers here, they receive requests, they look up files associated with the request, they process that file if it's necessary, and then they send or serve the file back to the requesting web browser, okay? Hence, we call these guys web servers. So any computer that we would refer to as running server software, any kind of server software, its job is to serve data to requesting agents. That's what a server is. Okay, so yeah. if you have a database server at some place, the job of that database server is to likely run some database database management software, receive requests, the database software goes and looks data up and serves that data back to the requester. Yeah. All right, so when we say server, that's typically what we're talking about. Okay, so having said that, I'm going to write here, we're going to say types of files. So what types of files might exist on a web server? Well, the most obvious ones are HTML files. 
Okay, but we might also have .php files. Okay, we might also have .py files for Python files. Okay, .rb files for Ruby files, so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, you said you've heard of PHP before? Yeah. Okay, do you know anything about PHP? No idea. Okay, so... Um, let's just talk about it then at the high level right now, and then at some point I'll swing back through. All right, so if the job of a web server is to ultimately spit out HTML and JavaScript... All right, so when data is flying in this direction, yeah. when it's flying in that direction, that data has to be in HTML JavaScript format. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Um. Who's the recipient of data leaving the web server in this direction? The web browser. Web browser. And what does the web browser understand? It understands the HTML and JavaScript. HTML and JavaScript, right? Sure. Okay, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you don't speak Klingon, right? Yeah. Okay. Have you heard of Klingon before? Never. Oh, it's a Star Trek reference. You're too young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, do you speak Russian? No. Okay, so you, but you've heard of Russian. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so so because you don't speak Russian, it would be unwise for me to be sending you information in Russian, correct? So, you know, the same thing is true here. If I want you to understand something, I have to pick a language that is one of the languages we have in common, right? So I don't know if you speak a second language or not, but we know we both share English, so the web server knows about HTML, Web browser understands HTML, so it would be in the web server's best interest to send information to the web browser using HTML. Sound good? All right, so the web server's job at the end of the day is no matter what it has to do to these files. So if we go back in here to this guy. So they process the file if necessary is what I put here. Well, what does this ultimately mean? One way or another... The server needs to get HTML and JavaScript to send to the client, the web browser. That makes sense? Yep. Okay. So if for some reason your computer pro your web browser has requested something.py or something.php instead of homepage.html. If they've requested some other file like that that might have a computer program inside of it, the web server would first have to run that program, would have to process that file in order to get the output of that file, which should be in HTML and JavaScript. Yeah. Does that make sense? All right. So if you were using Python as a web-based language, like I've kind of advertised, it's original home kind of was or maybe not its original home that's actually not even true um it's it became popular as a web language now it's actually probably the most popular as a data science and uh machine learning language uh realistically so at yeah. some point we can talk about that kind of stuff but you know python's much more general purpose than a lot of the other scripting languages which is why it's such a popular language um, and it was kind of early adopted by Google, which also made it very popular. Um, okay, so given that, if you are creating a computer program that you want to run on a web server, the output of that program should be HTML and JavaScript. Because if the program's running on a web server, presumably the, the, the client, the, the human being who's interacting with that program is going to be sitting in front of a web browser. Therefore, if you want to give them results, um, you know, interactions from your program, that has to show up on the screen of the web browser. That might, means that your output of your program has to put the stuff 
in the data representation language of HTML and any logic that has to run inside the web browser needs to be formatted as JavaScript. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's the job of this web server over here is either to just directly serve HTML files because they already have just HTML and JavaScript or to run the PHP, Python, or Ruby files um, internally to get their HTML and JavaScript output and then ultimately send that output across the internet back to the browser. Yep. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of the, the deal with our web languages as a whole. So if I go back here, now um, these, well, let's see, I don't want to do that language yet. Let's go this route. Let's talk about each of these in passing. So let's look at these web languages. Okay, so PHP, we're going to call this guy the first language made specifically for the web. Okay, so prior to PHP, the computer programs that sat on the, the backside of like web forms and things like that would have been like C programs or Perl programs. This would have been very much in the early days of the internet back when, um, you know, what you would have had at uh, companies that were, had, you know, had web pages for the very first time. You would have these Unix system administrator people who were very skilled at using a Unix or Linux servers. Um, you would have had them responsible for getting a web server installed and then having to uh, figure out how to, you know, keep up with the you know, newfangled web technology as it was starting to become somewhat cool. So they would have yep. been using tools that already existed before the internet, like Perl, like C, uh, like C++, and they would have been using those to ultimately write the programs that, ran, that the web server ran, which outputted HTML and JavaScript. Yep. Okay. Now, the good thing about that is they didn't have to go and learn something brand new. The bad thing about that is those languages were not necessarily designed to include tools and libraries that made web type things common okay yep. so having said that so php had libraries that made common internet stuff easy to accomplish hooking into databases like mysql processing web forms, all sorts of stuff like this, okay? Um, yep. So that was what's good about it. But now I'm gonna say the problem. Even though PHP is still actually popular today, it's kind of kept its shine um, for a while because some other industries have been built up around it, which solve some of the problems I'm about to mention. Okay, so um, the problem, so as websites, Started getting very complex. The PHP source files became large and hard to follow. Okay, so we looked at like at the Google, we did view sorts on the Google page a little bit ago. We saw there was a whole bunch of crap in there, right? Yeah. Right? Now, that's not so much a problem. That was the output in HTML and JavaScript. We're, we're going to say that that's not really an issue because we don't typically look at that. That's the web browser's job is to look at that stuff. Yeah. But back over here on the web server, when we store the .php file, this is some programmer who wrote this file. And inside yeah. of that file, you would have, so off of this point here, PHP files contained both HTML and PHP code intertwined. All right, so as your uh, uh, site got more and more complex, you would have had more and more logic inside of your pages, which means more PHP code. And also, you probably would have had more, you know, fancier interfaces, more stuff on the screen, that kind of stuff, so more HTML code. 
So all of a sudden you had this giant uh, collection of code, some of which is data representation, some of which is logic based, all inside the same file, making it pretty difficult to, uh, um, to work with. All right. Mm -hmm. So the solution. All right, so before I put the solution slide here, I'm going to throw another vocabulary term at you. Have you heard the phrase design pattern before? No. Okay, so this is more of a computer science-y, you know, research-y phrase. In fact, uh, um, have you heard the phrase uh, publish or perish before as it relates to uh, academics? No. All right. So one of the things when you, uh, uh, for people who are in academics, like, like me, professors and things like that, they work at research schools, you know, part of their job is to publish research papers. All right. That's, you know, so they teach classes and stuff like that, but they also have to publish scholarly research to, you know, like books and, and stuff like that. Um, and design patterns were great for uh, computer science uh, researchers because uh, uh, it, it kind of gave us an easy way of getting free papers. That's kind of the idea. So what is the design pattern? The design pattern is a proposed, I'm going to put it in quotes, good solution to a, quote, common problem. Yeah. All right, so that's what a design pattern is. Now, if we take it away from technology, you know, we can come up with our, you know, we can come up with a real life design pattern type thing. So, you know, pick your favorite kind of sandwich. I'm just going to use a generic thing like peanut butter and jelly. All right, so um, you might talk to three different people and they might have three different ways that they think is the best way to make a peanut butter and jelly, right? Whether you put the jelly on first or the peanut butter on first, or you kind of put it all together. So what I do is I kind of put the I put the peanut butter on in like clumps, so I don't risk ripping the bread, right? Then I dump some jelly on top of that, and then I take the pieces of bread and I smush them together so everything spreads out. Yep. That's the perfect way. There's only one way of doing it, so I hold the patent on that design pattern. But <laughs> the punchline would be is you could just as easily argue that you have a better way of making a peanut butter and jelly, right? Okay, so these are proposed good solutions to common problems. So now, how good the solution is, is kind of in the eyes of your audience. And how common of a problem something is, is in the, you know, eyes of, you know, whoever's reading your paper, for example. So who's going to care about um, good ways of making a peanut butter and jelly? Well, people who might eat peanut butter and jelly. So assuming somebody doesn't have a peanut allergy or something like that, and they happen to enjoy peanut butter and jellies, they might be in the, they might be interested at some level in a good way of making one, right? But if you are somebody who works for Lockheed Martin, uh, writing missile tracking software, um, at that point, a common problem for you might be blowing things up. Okay, well, that might not necessarily be on everybody's radar. So <laughs> that's not going to be of interest to a lot of people. So really, the punchline here is, is a design problem, a design pattern means something very generic. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so it means something very generic. But over the years, oh, here, I'm going to throw one more little caveat here. Okay, and this is not an absolute rule, but we're going to still say they must have a weird name. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much all design patterns have some sort of weird, uh, weird name. All right. Yeah. So now over time, some design patterns, some of these proposed things that, you know, academics put out there just for a free paper or something like that, they end up rising to the top and people say, you know what, that actually is a good idea. All right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just waiting to get my, um, I don't know if they do Nobel prizes for peanut butter and jelly, but something important like that. All right. <laughs> so one of these is something called MVC. All right. Yep. That's the one we're going to care about before. Now, have you ever seen these three letters next to each other like this before? Never. Okay. It's actually kind of a common tech thing that you might see in, um, you know, websites or something like that. Just kind of thrown out there, especially on programming type pages. You might see them thrown out there just assuming that the audience knows what it is. But my experience has been that many people who use this phrase or use this, this uh, I don't know, acronym, don't know what it means. All right. So this guy stands for Model 
U controller. Okay, that's what it stands for. All right, so now yep. what the heck does that mean? It means this. It is a, quote, good idea to separate your interface from your logic from your data. All right, so we just mentioned a few minutes ago that one of the problems with PHP is that as our pages, you know, as we started using the internet for more complex things, our PHP pages got really, really complex. And by putting all of our code and all of our interface design stuff inside the same file, it became hard to work with. So MVC would say, why don't you take your interface and put it in one place? And why don't you put your logic in another place? Yep. Okay. Now, the caveat to this, though, is if we do this, we must now provide a way for those separate pieces to talk to each other. Yeah. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when we're talking about design patterns like MVC, MVC is an idea, not an implementation. So design patterns are ideas. Let's kind of throw that on the slide here. Implementation. All right, so for example, in any sort of technology where MVC may, may be beneficial, that technology would have to come up with their own way of implementing MVC. Okay, so for example, once I teach MVC in like the kind of a starter perspective, then I have to go and teach people how, you know, let's say I'm teaching an Android programming class. Well, you have to learn how is MVC accomplished in Android Studio. If I'm teaching an iPhone programming class, how is MVC accomplished inside of Xcode, which is yep. Apple's development tool? If I'm teaching a game programming class, how is MVC accomplished inside of Unity? You know, that type of stuff. Make sense? Yep. Okay, so MVC is the idea of having different parts of your program your logic, your interface, and your data in three separate places so they're individually easier to manage, but then having some way of still getting them to talk to each other because sometimes your logic is going to have to make your interface update. You know, if you're watching the, if you're on a website and you want to know the current score of the Packers game, a long time ago you had to keep hitting refresh. Now you can just sit on the page and it gets a live update, right? Yeah. Because okay, there's some computer program somewhere that is updating your interface. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So that's the idea of MVC. And PHP struggled because it did not have MVC as part of its technology. Now, over the years, there have been third-party products that have come into existence, third-party tools, um, that have allowed us to use MVC with PHP. So now they say, just put all your code in the PHP file, and now we're going to give you a way of representing your interfaces and then a way to get those two guys talking to each other. Okay? So yep. PHP didn't really die because some other folks came along and said, hey, if you want to put together this development environment that allows you to build your interfaces as well as use PHP, you're good. All right? But some technologies in the meantime did come along let me throw I'm gonna throw one more weakness out here for PHP so that was one weakness of PHP another weakness for PHP call this the other problem you needed an IT skill set to get your development environment set up before you could even start programming. All right. So, uh, at the let's I'll just use the example from the college level. So, at, in our computer science department uh, at my university, we have two different majors. One major is computer science, the other major is information technology. 
Okay, and these yeah. guys are, are different sides of the same coin. I tell people that about that a computer scientist spends about 75% of their time creating new things, mostly programming, and 25% yeah. of the time using things that have already been created. Third-party APIs, maybe integrating Google Maps into your software, that kind of stuff. Whereas yeah. IT spends about 75% of their time using things that have already been created, various pieces of server software, software packages, stuff like that. And 25% of the time creating new things, probably writing scripts for doing system backups and that kind of stuff. Okay, so they're different yeah. sides of the same coin. Um, now, in general, people who are programmers do not necessarily have um, the IT skill set, all right? And what I mean by that is you kind of have, to, you know, actually my household would probably be a good example. My wife and I are both programmers, but I'm also a computer enthusiast outside of that. So I learned how to do all the server stuff, run routers, all this stuff, because it was a hobby of mine. It wasn't something I necessarily learned in school. Okay. Well, that's not something she does. So when we have to do something like that, I'm in charge of doing those things. So if she yeah. were to sit down and be a, and was a PHP programmer, she would need to rely on somebody else to go and set up the server and everything for her to be able to even test her programs. Or she would have to spend some time, you know, looking at tutorials and things like that to get her server set up before she could even start programming, which is where her actual skill set lies. That makes sense. Yeah. So this was really actually a problem for PHP developers because it was it was difficult for you just to sit down and start coding. <laughs> you had to. Yeah. You, um, now again, that also got fixed with some third party places. For instance, you can go to GoDaddy.com, and for five bucks a month, you can get a um, web hosting that already has PHP configured. That type of yeah. thing. There's also some other free uh, third party things you can download to your computer that just basically give you a little mini local PHP web server that for you to run your at your your program in, run your web page in while you're designing it before you actually go to deploy it to the internet. Okay? But in the early days when those things weren't there, these were problems. Alright, so and a technology like Ruby on Rails came out. Ruby is the name of the language. Rails is the name of their built in web server. All right, so we'll say two things here. Ruby on Rails had MVC and a web server built in. Yeah. So you can just download Ruby on Rails and instantly start programming and running your code. And um, um, you had MVC support right after that. Now we might say a problem was that you were locked into doing things the Ruby on Rails, or what the, the cool kids just call it Rails. They might say, I'm a, I'm a Rails developer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, then you just know to slap them and move on. Because yeah, <laughs> chances are, if they say they're a Rails developer, that's the only technology that they know. They've just married themselves to this technology um, and now if you look at the list here, they're stuck somewhat here in the, uh, in the past. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Which is actually somewhat funny because my wife is a COBOL programmer. So if I were to add her language over here, te technically she had yeah, nuts. No, I don't have room above the, <laughs> so there's a language here. I'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and put it on here. So there's a language here called COBOL. I'm going to have to stretch this out a little bit. So she works in this, um, this COBOL language, which is made for business applications. All right. Um, yeah. And it actually is loosely based off of C. So it actually would fit on this screen before, uh, somewhere, but it isn't in competition with these other ones. So COBOL probably sits, I don't know, somewhere like in this lineage here or something like that. All right. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, only old people write code in that. 
So it's, it's like my wife's five feet from me. <laughs> so that's what she does all day, every day. She writes cobalt. Um, yeah. yeah, so she, she's been doing that for like 18 years. So longer than you have been a thing. She's been, she's been writing in that thing. All right, so... Um, yeah, so in any case, uh, you know, Ruby, Ruby on Rails f f solved a problem that PHP had, but they really kind of pigeonholed people into doing things the Ruby, Ruby way. So if you ever do like a crash course on um, Ruby on Rails, it is very strange actually at first, because there's almost a lot of you know, things almost happen, I'll just put it in here, things happen almost magically all right because so much of the stuff is done for you now yep. if you're trying to create rapid application development for web pages becoming an expert in ruby on rails is is awesome so if you go online you see a lot of these like coding boot camps and stuff like that that guarantee jobs yep. a lot of them are teaching ruby on rails because they're trying to put people into positions at companies that are just trying to put out website after website after website. And if you're really just targeting web pages, Ruby on Rails is incredibly powerful because once you know their ecosystem, you can make business websites really quickly. For instance, yeah. uh, Twitter was written using Ruby on Rails. Um, they've had to since change that because now Twitter is also a mobile app. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so they kind of ran into some limitations there. All right, so let me just at least start the slide for the next thing. So we'll remind, remember when we pick back up. So we'll get into Python and uh, I'll actually talk about Node.js next. do that that should remind me all right and I'll make sure I follow up with um, uh, Vincent right after we're done and make sure that he gets the um, I'll have him put the next two assignments up yeah. um, just in case you want to get off to the races but at the, at the very least then the, you'll make sure you have enough work for next week that sound yep. like a good plan yep okay so uh, we're on for same time same station next week yep Okay, well, cool. Well, have a um, happy Thanksgiving. Eat a lot of food. Don't drink too much alcohol. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I say to my other students, but I have a feeling I might need to say that to you, too, a little bit. Uh, so, in any case, I will see you in a week. All right, see you. Bye. All right, take care. Bye-bye.